All right, we're going to wait for folks to join us here. Good afternoon, guests and participants. Come on in, get comfortable, pull up a seat, and we'll get started. All right. Good afternoon, guests and participants. My name is Alicia Vellante, and I am a campaign and research coordinator for Private Equity Stakeholder Project. We welcome you to the Workers Challenging Private Equity to Create Good Jobs webinar, brought to you by the Private Equity Stakeholder Project and Cornell University's ILR School. Today, you will hear, you will hear from workers employed by private equity owned companies and how they are standing up and fighting for good and safe jobs. We are pleased to have such incredible interest in this webinar. It's been overwhelming. We have roughly 300 people registered, including, but not limited to, workers and worker centers, unions, students, university faculty, policymakers, reporters, and pension fund representatives. Thank you all for joining us today. Private Equity Stakeholder Project, or PESP, is a nonprofit organization serving as a watchdog of the private equity industry, shining a light on the industry's impacts, assets, and risks. Our mission is to engage and connect stakeholders affected by private equity and to ensure investors and policymakers take a comprehensive account of the risks associated with private equ uh, equity investments. Labor and jobs is one of five main issue areas PESP addresses. Other issue areas, uh, issue areas include housing, healthcare, environment and climate, civil rights and incarceration. For more information and to access our robust list of reports, please visit our website at pestakeholder.org. That's pestakeholder.org. Now the private equity industry has grown dramatically in recent years. Private equity and other private fund firms had less than a trillion dollars in assets under management in 2004. They now manage more than $7.5 trillion and are growing quickly. In the first half of 2021, private equity firms had their busiest six months ever, announcing 6,298 deals worth $513 billion, according to the Financial Times. As private equity firms and deals have grown, they have, come, uh, they have come to impact growing numbers of people. In the past year, private equity firms have acquired companies with hundreds of thousands of workers, such as the security company G4S with 530,000 employees, and Dunkin' Brands, which has 330,000 employees working at its Dunkin' Donuts and Baskin Robbins stores. Private equity firms have often taken a low road approach and sought to reduce wages, benefits, and staffing at portfolio companies they, they acquire, with devastating consequences to millions of workers, their families, and their communities. The industry owns companies that employ more than 11.7 million American workers, plus millions around the world. And for this reason, PESP in collaboration with the National Employment Law Project and Jobs with Justice is demanding that private equity industry uh, invest in its workplace by immediately prioritizing the following measures, paying a sustainable wage of at least $15 an hour, providing paid sick leave and affordable health care committing to end occupational segregation, providing safe working conditions, paying severance during layoffs, and protecting workers' rights to organize. Currently, we have over 20 signatories standing in solidarity with private equity employed workers, including Communication Workers of America, or CWA, the United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers of America, or UE, the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance, SEIU Local 26 and SEIU Healthcare Minnesota, Teamsters Local 117, Koreatown Immigrant Workers Alliance or Kiwa, and Unite Here Locals 1 and 11. Thank you for your support. If you haven't already, I invite you to add your organization's name to our private equity labor demands today. The link is in the chat. Now, 
It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce an amazing scholar and activist, Rosemary Batt, who was gracious enough to uh, moderate our conversation today. Rosemary is an Alice Cook Professor of Women and Work at Cornell University's ILR School. Professor Batt works in human resource studies and international and comparative labor, and her research focus, uh, focuses on comparative international students of management and employment relations, with particular attention to the impact of financialization on management and employment and the globalization and restructuring of service industries and its impact on low wage workers. It's astounding. Her recent research publications addressed public equity corporate governance and the fragmentation of work in contemporary employment relations. Rose has authored numerous books, book chapters, and hundreds of article-length publications, including her February 2021 article, The Agency Cost of Private Equity, Why Do Limited Partners Funds Still Exist? And I'm sorry, Still Invest, which you can find in the Academy of Management Perspectives. Without further ado, Professor Rosemary Batt. So Alicia, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, that was a very gracious introduction. What I also want to say is my most important learning was when I was a union organizer for the Healthcare Workers Union 1199 uh, for many years. And I was so exhausted from that, that I had to retire. And my third career is as a professor so that I can support workers uh, with my research and education and train the next generation of labor activists at the Industrial Labor Relations School. So um, I kudos to all of you who are in the field. Uh, I know what a burnout job it is. It's, it's so uh, tough and I appreciate you being on the front line. So anyway, I um, just let me say I've studied private equity for 10 years uh, or more, particularly with my colleague, Eileen Applebaum who actually testified uh, on the Hill in support of the Stop uh, Looting Wall Street, the Stop Wall Street Looting Act. And um, she would love to be here today, but she has been super in her leadership uh, in Washington. Um, and I'm happy, so happy to be the moderator of this session so that I can learn what's really going on in the field because it's hard for me to keep up and I wanna share those stories also with my own students. Um, what I do wanna do is say a couple words about private equity and why we should care. So the first is that as Alicia said, uh, private equity firms have amassed millions and now actually trillions, uh, 7.5 trillion dollars internationally to invest, invest in companies, which is really how they extract money from companies. And they, um, uh, hey, they do so, first of all, by taking a public uh, company private so that it no longer has to report to the Securities and Exchange Commission, and thereby it can do whatever it wants without the public really knowing. So that's a major uh, problem. The second is that uh, they buy up companies using a tremendous amount of debt, usually about 70%. And so that loads debt on the company uh, that has maybe never had debt before. And suddenly the company has to pay a lot in interest. They have to service the debt. And then private equity firm managers take over the company, run it, and do things like uh, focus on cost cutting, uh, focus on extracting wealth from the company, and then exiting it in a matter of three to five years. So they're in it for the short term. They want to extract whatever wealth they can. They may sell off assets or property, whatever they can, pay themselves back and get out. So that's why we are so worried about this expansion, as Alicia said, of private equity, uh, which now covers uh, some 11.7 million workers. Um, the third issue is, as Alicia also alluded to, the disproportionate impact is on women and minority or uh, workers or people of color, because those are the industries that private equity targets. And so uh, they include, for example, 1.5 million workers in food service, 1.1 million workers in retail, and almost 1 million workers in healthcare and in 
security services. So these are jobs that are held by women and, and, and minority people of color. And so they are disproportionately affected by the, um, the tactics of private equity. Um, during the pandemic, I also wanna add that private equity firms managed to get CARES Act money, that is government subsidies when they're sitting on trillions of dollars, which is totally a waste of taxpayers' money. And um, their financial engineering tricks have led to the bankruptcies of well-known brands such as uh, Neiman Marcus, Toys R Us, J. Crew, Sports Authority, Art Van, Furniture, Nine West, and many, many others. So that in the last five years, six years alone, uh, some hundreds of thousands of jobs have been lost due to their ownership and their financial engineering techniques. Um, they, the research shows that private equity uh, firms have, uh, companies have twice the level of bankruptcy rates. And this is not just a problem of workers losing their jobs, but losing their pensions too. So often with the bankruptcy, private equity manages to offload the pension, workers are left with a very small proportion of what they otherwise would have received. Now, um, the final thing is that even when a company survives, it's hit with understaffing because they're cutting costs. And that means to uh, work intensification and stress on the job. And this is particularly uh, serious in healthcare where, for example, workers don't have the supplies they need. They don't have a staff to take care of the patients, particularly in the COVID era. So uh, there are. This is all well documented, including exposés by uh, the Private Equity uh, Stakeholder Project. So um, let me just move quickly to say that I want to reiterate the agenda that Private Equity uh, Stakeholder Project has um, enumerated for what private equity firms should do, particularly in low wage sectors such as pay a minimum wage of $15 an hour, provide sick leave, provide health care, provide benefits, uh, provide decent jobs. And um, they say they're creating jobs, but they're not taking responsibility for good jobs. And so they can't uh, voluntarily self-regulate because they're never gonna do that. So that's where worker power needs to step in. That's where organizing needs to step in. And what I want to just highlight today are a few of the ways, summary, that workers are taking power, unions are strategizing, and then you'll hear from um, the panelists uh, with real world examples. So first of all, we'll hear from workers at a number of private equity owned companies who are organizing and building power to challenge the private equity firms there and demand better jobs. Uh, second, there are workers and unions working to contact investors. So the pension funds that are investing and telling them they better look up, they better um, take responsibility for their investments in private equity because pension funds represent a third, a third of all the money that goes into private equity. So why are pension funds using workers' capital to invest in uh, investment funds that undermine workers' jobs and stability. So this is something we really need to push hard on, and um, we need to make sure that uh, the, the pension funds recognize, oftentimes they don't even know that this is where their money is going. Um, there are examples from the New York State Retirement Fund and the Oregon Public Employees Fund uh, that are investing in um, a private equity firm that owns Dunkin' Donuts and these uh, retail chains. Um, and I third wanna say that um, workers and unions are demanding that lawmakers curb uh, the works excesses. And in this uh, uh, webinar today, we'll hear from people who are well versed in the uh, Stop Wall Street Looting Act and we will go through the number of ways in which that uh, legislation is designed to curb the worst excesses of private equity. So with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to our speakers and not waste any more time. So um, 
I want to go directly to our first speaker, if uh, that's okay, Alicia. Um, and the first speaker is Phil Conti, who is a member of the UFCW Local 400 and a shop steward at the Safeway Grocery Store in Maryland. And the Albertsons Safeway Supermarket is owned by a consortium of private equity firms. The leading one, the most important one, is Cerberus. Uh, private equity. And uh, Albertsons paid Cerberus and other investors almost $350 million in fees and dividends just between 2013 and 18 alone. So just in four, five years, just in fees, they've extracted that wealth that, that's set aside from the other ways in which they pull out money from this company. So I really look forward to hearing from Phil and I'll turn it over to you now. All righty. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Philip Conti. I've been with Safeway for 38 years now. Uh, I've been the dairy lead for the past 10 years. I've done several other jobs throughout my career at Safeway. I've been a union shop steward at my store for 11 years. My job as a dairy lead consists of ordering product and putting product on the shelves um, to service our customers. I also build displays, make sure the shelves are neat and clean. Uh, these are some of the things I've, some, some of the changes I've seen in Safeway since the takeover uh, by Cerberus, the private equity firm. Employees' hours have been cut. There have been long lines in stores because of limited cashiers. Um, Self-checkouts have been installed. One person runs a set, several self-checkouts where there could be employees running actual registers. So that's a way that they've cut out some of the uh, employees in some of the hours. Um, the company is not career-oriented anymore. There are no full-time positions available unless you become a department head or you go into management. The turnover ratio is very high. It's hard to, uh, to complete tasks when we are short, uh, when we are short staffed. Some stores are run down and not kept up. Prices are easing up over the local competition. competition. Um, during our last contract, the company did not want to fund our pension plan. I'm gonna give you an example of understaffing. The company pushes for us to put up the whole load on the day that it comes in. There are times when I get five or six pallets of dairy on one delivery and I'm expected to have everything from that delivery up before I leave for the day, which is impossible sometimes. During the contract negotiations, the company did not want to budge on completely funding our pension. Cerb, like she said earlier, Cerberus has extracted $250 million in management fees and dividends since buying Safeway. So why wouldn't they want to fund our pension plan? Um, we held rallies all over DC, Maryland, DC, and Virginia area to bring attention to the customers that spend their hard earned money to show them how we were being treated. We had one rally in downtown DC where we used the giant three headed inflatable dog, which is referred to as the Hound of Hades to show what Cerberus means. Private equity firms are only interested in profit and not employees. They put companies in debt, then sell them off. We also visited one of the committees in Congress to voice our concerns on these private equity firms and the way they were treating us. We went to Philadelphia to talk to some of the shareholders for Cerberus to try to get them to got, try to get them not to invest in a company that did not want to fund our pension. And as a last resort, we were prepared to go on strike. And that's definitely what we were going to do if we didn't get these negotiations done. 
I enjoy having my union job um, is gave me the opportunity to earn a living wage and provide for my family and work in a safe environment. Having a union job also gave me access to affordable health care, which is something that's so important today. So these are some of the reasons I became a steward. These are some of the reasons I wanted to get involved and with my union to stop these private equity firms from doing some of the things that they're doing. Thank you. Okay, I had to unmute myself. I want to turn next to Ed Gadomsky. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, your st stories resonate with so many other stories we've we've heard, and um, I'm so glad that you. Uh, it sounds like you were able to ne uh, negotiate your contract in the end, and I hope that worked out. So, turning to Ed. Uh, he is with the Connecticut Healthcare Associates 1199, asked me, and he previously worked at the Waterbury Hospital, which was bought by Prospect Medical Holdings, which is a private equity firm, in 2016. Um, and uh, the, pro the private equity firm is known as Leonard Green. By the way, I would just add, they're one of the worst. Uh, buying up uh, safety net hospitals where people most need health care. And um, they own 17 hospitals in five states. And Leonard Green and others have collected $658 million in fees and dividends from the safety net hospitals in just the last uh, few years. So let me turn it to Ed. And thank you uh, for being here. Thank you, Rosemary. My name is Ed Godowski, and I was employed at Waterbury Hospital for 32 years as a PC tech in the IT department. In 2016, Prospect Medical Group Holdings and its controlling private equity company, Leonard Green and Partners, based out of California, took ownership of Waterbury Hospital located in Waterbury, Connecticut. Waterbury Hospital was converted from being a nonprofit hospital to a for profit hospital under the terms of the sale. Within a year, 85% of supervisors, managers, and directors at Waterbury Hospital were replaced with Prospect's own management team, many of whom split their management time between Waterbury Hospital and ECHN, which is another hospital, another Prospect Medical Group hospital located in Connecticut. In the very first year, layoffs became a household word for the Waterbury Hospital workers as employees were targeted at a staggered pace to avoid any type of bad publicity in the, in the local newspapers. Longevity employees usually making the higher pay wages were particularly targeted and replaced. There were also agreements made during the sale to include community involvement that have gone by the wayside. And I have seen other local organizations such as the Western Connecticut Area Labor Federation and the Naugatuck Valley Project call out Prospect Medical Group Holdings for not keeping their promises. I personally have testified my story in four different states to Leonard Green investors about the working conditions since the hospital sale in 2016. On July 17th of 2020, Waterbury Hospital asked for and received a $17 million property tax break from the city of Waterbury. Before approval, Waterbury Hospital CEO and new president Lester Schindel stated there would be no elimination of jobs. Just two weeks later, on August 3rd of 2020, 10 information technology employees were summoned to the hospital conference room where we were informed of our termination. Effective September 1st, our positions were being outsourced to India. I testified in September of 2020 in front of the same councilman and Waterbury mayor that approved that $17 million tax break without the councilman doing any type of investigation or homework other than the hospital president's testimony and their jaws hit the floor when I told them what had happened and that they were lied to. In addition, we provided documentation of the state and federal funding that Waterbury Hospital received that same year and the multi-million dollar net profit the company made between 2016 and 2019. 
I received a phone call that same night from legislator Michael D.G. Von Carlo telling me how they couldn't believe the city was duped into handing over all that money. I was offered my old job back, but at a new pay rate of $13.46 per hour. In my case, that was about one third of my salary after 32 years at the hospital. In addition to the low pay rate offer, we were told we must find our own insurance. R4 wanted us to be on call for free, and we were told that R4 will no longer contribute to any retirement plan. In my case, I would be taking a pay cut of $25,000 per year, and that is before factoring in my $13.46 pay raise. Within a month, all the terminated employees were, repl were replaced with contractors from the outside now working for the company R4. The PC techs are covered by a union contract that has a successorship clause stating that any bargaining unit operations that is sold or transferred involving bargain unit, involving bargain unit mem members, that the new ownership must honor our current contract, which they did not. Prospect Medical Group Holdings and its controlling private equity company, Leonard Green and Partners, simply don't care. The fear among the current hospital workers is that they believe Prospect Medical Group will slowly outsource department by department, and there's nothing we can do about it, as they are now a private for-profit sector. We also believe, given Prospect Group's documented history, that it's just a matter of time before they sell the hospital just like a builder flips houses for a profit. It is obvious the Prospect Medical Group holdings based out of California can give two hoots about what happens in Waterbury, Connecticut, other than the bottom dollar line figure from Waterbury Hospital. I'm now working as an internal organizer for the CHCA union that represents the nurses and techs at Waterbury Hospital. I was a lead delegate for the hospital employees while I worked at the hospital and was on the negotiating committee during their last contract negotiations. I, I now work tirelessly as a representative on behalf of the union workers. The hospital has lost nearly 40% of its entire staff during the 2020-2021 COVID related year. Staffing at Waterbury Hospital is so low that we are in an emergency all hands on deck meaning managers and other non-union employees are filling in for direct patient care positions throughout the hospital. As you could imagine, that brings about many safety concerns for both the staff and patients coming into the hospital. Waterbury Hospital has started to offer $20,000 incentive bonuses to try and retain their staff that are left at the hospital, and many are still not signing the incentive which requires a two year minimum requirement to work at Waterbury Hospital because of the safety issues and structure of departments and how they are run. One positive note from my viewpoint as the union rep, these nurses and techs have had enough. Negotiations for a new contract are set to begin next summer and I am convinced the staff with the current morale and non-show of support from hospital management is willing to put all their cards on the table with a list of proposals that need to be changed or they will strike if necessary. Nobody ever wants to strike, but Waterbury Hospital has 100% participation in the unions by its techs and nurses, and they, they have had enough and will do whatever it takes to clean up working conditions that focus on safety for both the hospital staff and its patients. As a former Prospect Medical Group's IT worker, I found out the hard way that promises from a large out-of-state for-profit private equity controlled hospital chain cannot be trusted, even when workers are in a union. For that reason, and to assist those who will be in my shoes working for profit, working at a for-profit hospital in the future, I urge you to continue the fight against Wall Street taking over our hometown communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. That's uh, that's amazing uh, story. I'm sorry you've gone through such terror, and um, you know how much the lives of healthcare workers have been destroyed in the context of the pandemic, which makes it, of course, even worse. Um, I've heard horror stories of uh, Prospect Medical for many years now, and this this is just icing on the cake for sure. Um, let me turn to Zella Roberts now, who is um, 
from North Carolina and has worked at a car hop at Sonic Drive-In, which is owned by another private equity firm named Rourke Capital. And over the last few years, Rourke has built a food service empire and now owns many chains such as Dunkin' Donuts, Arby's, John, uh, Jimmy John's, Hardee's, Carl J's, and Buffalo Wild Wings. So they're expanding rapidly. They are the uh, employers essentially of, of uh, hundreds of thousands of workers. Uh, in fact, almost 1 million under their uh, companies and franchises. So Zella, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, as, as Rosemary was saying, my name's Zella. I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and I'm currently working at Ease of Pottery. I worked at Sonic as a car hop while I was finishing up my social work degree at Warren Wilson College. I spent eight months at Sonic between October 2020 through May 2021 during the height of the pandemic. While I was at Sonic, I worked most of my shifts um, as a car hop. My job was basically to run out orders and collect payment for customers. But as I gained more experience, I was expected to take orders over the headphones, which is a separate position known as switchboard operator. I received no additional payment for working the switchboard and car hops like me were actually paid a tipped wage of $5 an hour versus the $9 an hour that switchboard operators start at. Um, however, the payment system did not allow customers to leave tips when paying with a credit or debit card. Due to this oversight, most customers don't realize that they need to tip their car hop. The entire time that I worked at Sonic, we were exposed to hundreds of unmasked customers a day because Sonic didn't require that guests follow any COVID protocol at all. Sonic is part of Inspire Brands, which is owned by an Atlanta-based private equity company called Rourke Capital. Rourke is known for having among the highest percentage of full-time employees on public assistance. Understanding the company who owns the company that I worked for was very useful information in organizing my fellow workers to address COVID-19 policy, issues impacting tipped workers, and rampant wage theft. Understanding private equity firms as employers helped me to map power in my workplace and identify who had the authority to honor worker demands. I knew that um, I wasn't, the way that I was being treated at Sonic was unacceptable, but I wasn't sure how to get started. So I reached out to my local Restaurant Opportunity Center United chapter, and the folks at, RAP, at Rock coached me through some organizing techniques and helped me to create a petition with the organization coworker, urging Sonic Corporate to upgrade tipping, tipping software, introduce a COVID policy for guests, and introduce a COVID policy for guests. The petition took off overnight and has received over 8,000 signatures from Sonic workers and supporters. In late January, Sonic updated their app software to allow customers to do tips via the Sonic app. Although this is a step in the right direction, this only makes up a small percentage of orders placed on a card. Um, through Coworker, I was put in touch with Private Equity Stakeholder Project, and I learned that Sonic was actually owned by a private equity firm, Rourke Capital. The staff at PASS provided me with a comprehensive report on Rourke, and I learned that the best way to get Rourke's attention was through their investors. So I started sharing my story um, during public comment at pension fund meetings. As a first generation college student, I have long struggled with imposter syndrome. And during my first investor meeting, these feelings were really difficult to ignore. But as I got more practice, I learned how to manage my performance anxiety. It felt like preparing for a presentation, so I started um, so I treated it like I would any other project. I started by preparing an outline of the points I wanted to cover and practice in my mirror until I felt fluent. Um, I spoke at several pension funds, including Los Angeles City um, Employees Retirement Systems, uh, New Jersey State Investment Council, Arizona State Retirement Systems, and the Oregon Investment Council. And I followed up with these boards several times. The Sonic campaign has also received ongoing press coverage due to the labor shortage. I've worked with publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the American Prospect, and most recently, NBC News. Journalist Gretchen Morganson published a brave article exposing the connection between private equity ownership and lower wages. 
CEO of Sonic, Claudia San Pedro, was recently appointed to the Board of Trustees at Smith College. So I collaborated with campus activists to launch an email writing campaign, asking that San Pedro respond to worker demands or step down from her role at Smith College. Sonic has been responsive to worker demands to an extent. However, when asked about card tipping in the stalls, Sonic's official Twitter can be quoted saying, we are currently working on tipping compatibility within our interactive menu, stay tuned, as far back as 2018. We've gotten impatient and we won't stop the fight until the software has been updated once and for all. If you'd like to support a cause, please share a petition with folks in your network. Private equity, uh, private equity ownership can be really confusing and it's often difficult for workers to know who to bring their issues to. Understanding private equity can help form strong worker coalitions. After learning more about work capital throughout my work with PESS, I reached out to other Inspire brand workers. I found that there were active campaigns on coworker run by people at Dunkin' Donuts and Jimmy John's. So we were able to use each other's mail lists to reach a wider base. I found it really eye-opening to learn about the level of lobbying power that private equity firms have on our political landscape. For example, work capital played a key role in derailing legislation raging, raising the minimum wage. A $15 minimum wage would have a profound impact on my monthly budget. Suddenly I'd be able to access healthcare, pay off my student loans and save money for an emergency. None of these things are very luxurious. They're just necessities that low wage workers are too often deprived of. It is truly evil how work has used their influence to undercut policy that would help so many people simply make ends meet. Their business model seems to be dependent on paying their hard working staff poverty wages. Thanks y'all. Wow, thank you so much, Zella. That's an amazing story and uh, you're brave. That's all I can say, you're brave and thank you for really stepping up and I'm sure you feel much stronger and powerful yourself now that you've been through all of this. Uh, I just wanna say that uh, you're absolutely right. We have tracked the lobbying dollars that private equity firms have put into uh, Congress, but it's also true that workers have very large lobbying power and also, I think you're going before pension funds and telling them what is really going on is really powerful and effective. So I, I hope that you and others continue to do that. They are vulnerable. They feel bad when they hear how the pension funds are being spent. So let me turn now to Jesse, Jesse Harmon, who... Um, is from the Cheesecake Factory in, Arizona, in uh, LA. And she's going to read a statement of, from Lindsay Ruck, who is an actual server at Cheesecake Factory in Arizona. Lindsay uh, at the last minute couldn't be with us, but Jesse, we're very happy uh, to have you here. And um, uh, these um, great women are members of Rock United, which is the Restaurant Opportunity Center. And they have been organizing against uh, Rourke Capital, uh, which invested 200 million in uh, Cheesecake Factory. So Rourke, it's the same one that was, owns uh, Duncan and uh, Sonic, as we've just said. And um, I'm sorry about that. <coughs> in June of this year, Cheesecake Factory paid 457 million to buy back most of Rourke's stake. Rourke retained over 100 million shares in the company, which means that Rourke invested 200 million and in one an hour, um, a year and a half, got 550 million, excuse me. Um, so a staggering return. And uh, with that, let me turn it over to Jesse. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, my name is Jesse Harmon and I'm an organizer with the Restaurant Opportunity Center uh, Los Angeles chapter. Um, my colleague Lindsay, as she said, was uh, unable to make it today, so I'm more than happy to uh, speak on her behalf. Uh, she's been a server and bartender at the Cheesecake Factory in Chandler, Arizona for about 14 years at this point. Um, and this is Lindsay's story. In the midst of the pandemic, summer of 2020, Roar Capital invested $200 million in the Cheesecake Factory who was struggling with liquid assets, becoming a majority sh shareholder in the company. A year later, Cheesecake Factory bought back most of the stocks for $457 million, more than doubling Rourke's initial investment. 
At this time, Bork still maintains a smaller number of shares and Rourke's president, Paul Ginsburg, is still a Cheesecake Factory board member. All this while cooks were forced to work shoulder to shoulder in the kitchen and servers required to care for unmasked and often unruly guests. And all of us asked to be the engine that would drive the restaurant away from collapse. We never saw a raise or even hazard pay, and yet our labor drove stock prices and allowed Rourke to more than double their investment. Myself and a group of other Cheesecake Factory workers from Southern California have now attended two pension fund meetings, each having its own rules, pitfalls, and successes. Our first was Lacers, the LA County, excuse me, LA City Employee Retirement System. Our initial foray into this form of advocacy produced the usual jitters that come from delivering a speech to a possibly hostile audience. We knew we'd each only have a few minutes to speak and so had decided in advance to divide and conquer. Instead of delivering four similar speeches, we would each own an aspect of our overall message. Drew would speak about Cheesecake Factory's COVID policies and how they would often be sporadically enforced to the detriment of workers' health and safety. Sophia would cover the Cheesecake's finances, its inordinately high CEO's pay, and its lack of investment in both its location and employees. Pablo told stories of fellow employees on the ground who were directly affected by these conditions, the line cooks that are understaffed, underpaid, and overworked, employees who are too afraid to speak up because of toxic management, and the exodus of workers as the direct result of all of this. Lastly, I spoke to our demands, what we wanted to change before pensions gave their funds to work capital. Like many workers, our demands are obvious. We want better pay and our health and well-being respected. We demanded the Cheesecake Factory as a million dollar restaurant go beyond the bare minimum every time that they could. The company-wide that they raised the bar and the base rate to 15 an hour for TIF workers and non-TIF workers, respectively, as well as two hour retroactive hazard pay. We asked that they use the CDC as their guide in regard to mass and capacity restrictions in order to keep employees safe from COVID, not the laxer state and local ordinances that have so often been politicized. In short, we asked them to encourage Cheesecake Factory and work capital to invest in us before they invested in them. Working with PESP, the Private Equity Stakeholders Project, to do these actions has helped us to amplify our message, given us a new tactic, and it combined well with many of our other ongoing efforts. Attending pension fund events has piqued the interest of reporters who are intrigued by this new avenue of activism. It has been a way to demonstrate to our coworkers the real tangible actions we're taking and the complaints with OSHA and the NLRB that we may also become points we can bring up to board members as evidence of the change that needs to happen. I and my fellow Cheesecake Factory workers understand that not everyone will be able to speak out at pension meetings, that some workers may not feel safe to speak out in any capacity and may feel constricted to use only the small circle of available internal options. That's why it's so important to those of us that feel called to do this work, that feel safe to speak out, do so again and again and again. Each time we do, not only do we bring greater awareness to others about what restaurant work is like for those of us in the trenches, we widen the circle of available methods to advocate for ourselves. And we demonstrate to other workers that, we, that you can speak up, you can speak out, and that there's a group who will have your back and walk with you too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, this is great. And it's wonderful to, again, hear inspiring stories of workers really taking action and particularly this new avenue of going after pension funds and getting on their agenda, I think is, is critical because it's another avenue in addition to uh, the traditional organizing that we have done. Um, so now I wanna turn it over to Anthony Sanchez. Uh, he works at a refresco plant in New Jersey, bottling Gatorade body armor. Arizona iced tea and Tropicana juices. And in 2017, PAI Partners, which is another private equity firm, became the co-owner of Refresco. And let me just point out as we go through these examples that often, you know, the private equity firm is behind actually kind of the puppeteer that we don't see, you know, pulling all the strings. And so when something goes wrong, we blame the brand company like Sonic or uh, Dunkin' Donut or whatever, when it is really the private equity owners and they are behind the scenes. So we don't even know their name, such as uh, PAA partners. So now let me uh, turn it over to Anthony, who has uh, um, been, um, there were a majority of workers um, at the plant who voted to join the United Electrical Radio and Machine Workers. 
and commonly known as UEE. And um, we're going to hear from Anthony on how you did that. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, nice to meet you all. My name is Anthony Sanchez, and I've been a machine operator for 15 years at the Refresco plant. Since Refresco implemented a 12 rather than eight hour schedule, I have been unable to meet all my expenses. I have two young children, ages eight and three, who depend on my financial support. Lately, my salary is not enough. I am not eating well because I have to buy cheap food to survive and to support my children. My nutrition is not good because to have a good nutrition is too expensive for me to afford. For me to meet all my expenses, I have always had to work overtime. But lately, overtime is not helping enough since Refresco implemented 12 hour schedule intending to eliminate overtime for the workers. There are now times when I can't pay my bills, barely paying the minimum of my credit card debt. And I'm always behind a month on my phone bills, internet and cable. The employer provided health insurance is abysmal, very expensive, limited coverage, high deductibles. I've had to go to the marketplace instead to get a better coverage. When I'm not at the plant, I live in a complete stress because when I'm not there, I think about how I have to go back and work. Then when I'm at work, it's not a friendly environment. I, it is hostile. I've been retaliated against for trying to organize a union at my workplace. In winning our union election back in June, we, we beat the combined forces of the world's largest bottling corporation. The same union busters used by Trump at his properties in a team of expensive DC lawyers, which include Jack Turner, the former executive secretary of the NLRB. They thought we could be easy to fool and that they will convince the majority of my workers to vote against our union. But we make sure to educate our coworkers so they could see right through the lies. Since we have won our union election, Refresco has done everything it can to delay our union victory certification by claiming that the NLRB and that Refresco itself engaged in misconduct during the election that we need a new election. The NLRB has said that there is no merit to these challenges, but labor law is weak and Refresco, Refresco gets to keep playing these games even through we warn our union fairly. Early this month, a convoy of my coworkers confronted plan manage, management in an office at work. Workers turned in letters with 120 signatures for workers demanding that the results of the union elections be respected and that they stop hiding behind lawyers. The 120 signatures are even more than the numbers of votes in favor of the union. So Refresco is dead, wrong if it thinks it's going to get us to give up. If Refresco continues playing legal game, we will only continue the pressure on them until they accept reality and understand that they can no longer try to run over us. 
the problems that cause, the problems that could be addressed through negotiations continue at the plan, for example, there have been two fires at the plant in the last three weeks. This is generally because of the lack of maintenance and on keep of the plant, bad management. In either case, the refresco management called the fire department. The fire alarms don't even go off either time. Refresco just has no regard for their employees' health. Please help us. Please help support the fight of my coworkers and me and tell PAI partners to do the right thing and have Refresco start bargaining with us. They need to stop stalling. It's up to me and my coworkers to improve our working condition and make our plan safe in a fair place to work. We will do, we will do through our union, through our organi organizing and with community support. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Anthony, this is an amazing story, a powerful story, and uh, that you have to be doing this all during the pandemic and when so many other things are uh, troubling and challenging for, for working families. Uh, and we wish you the best of luck as you continue this in this fight. We now want to turn to Michelle Hilt, who has a, a similar story in many ways. She is a member of the IUE CWA, which is the International Division of the Communication Workers of America. She worked for 20 years at a factory in Janesville, Wisconsin called Huffcore, uh, which manufactured portable room partitions for hotels and convention centers. And uh, Huffcore was a family business for 120 years, made it through all sorts of depressions all sorts of recessions and survived. Uh, but the company was purchased by Open Gate Capital, who is another uh, very scurrilous private equity firm we're aware of because just down the road, they uh, closed a dairy called the Guernsey Dairy in Wisconsin uh, a few years ago. And Open Gate announced it was closing the Huffcore factory uh, this year and shifting operations to Mexico, uh, permanently laying off 166 workers, many of whom, like Michelle, had spent their adult uh, working lives at the factory and have such, they have a great uh, uh, amount to lose. So I want to turn it over to you, Michelle, and thank you so much for uh, sharing your story with us. Hey. Um just going to give everybody a heads up that this is a really emotional subject for me. So I'm sorry. I've all day been trying to hold back, but, uh, okay. So I started working at Hubcore when I was 22. It was one of the higher paying jobs in the area. They had really good health insurance and it was a union shop. Sorry. I thought that's where I would stay and that's where I would retire from. Um, I was big into the union. Uh, I was a union rep for years. Then I moved up to vice president, um, ended up as diversity ambassador all the way up until the last day of my job. Um, I grew up in a blue collar family. So uh, my dad worked at GM, we had good life. So I just thought that that was the life I would have to. Um, so Huffcore was family owned and it, it felt like a family while we were working there. Um, everybody got along really well and there was a lot of employee gatherings. Uh, they would provide luncheons a lot if we had a good month, thanking us for our hard work. We had quarterly meetings. They'd let us know what was going on, big jobs coming up, uh, what the hours would be like for the month, next few months. 
Um, and then we got bought out by the equity firm and uh, about four years ago, I believe, and everything started to change. Uh, sorry. There was a lot of drastic changes. Um, there was no more meetings. Uh, well, there was one meeting to start where they assured us uh, people had looked into the company. So they had questions about, you know, they had heard about Guernsey and dairy and everything. So people had questions and they brought them to that meeting and they assured us that they were here to stay. They were going to turn the company around, which I'm not sure why, because I thought we were doing well as it was, uh, been around 120 years, like you said. Um, but yeah, so uh, they came in and they made all these promises, told us things were going to be fine. They had no plans on moving us or doing anything. They put a new roof on, which was like over $2 million, which really, you know, kind of was, okay, maybe they are here to stay. But I think it was just a way for them to waste a bunch of money. Um, so they made a lot of drastic changes. They got rid of our uh, management. There was no more holiday parties. There was no more quarterly meetings after that. Um, things just slowly started to disintegrate. Uh, they started bringing in all these uh, people to make all these different changes in the processes. And then they would just like be there for a few months and then they'd let them go and nothing ever really changed. And then um, a few months back, uh, we came into work and we were just told that the company was moving to Mexico and uh, we had two more months and then we were out of our jobs. And uh, so there was a new news article in the Gazette, the Janesville Gazette, this local paper uh, about us closing. And uh, they asked uh, HuffCorp about it and their representative told them that it was because of COVID, that COVID put them under. Well, I know for a fact this had been going on for years and years before COVID even hit. So that was, that was not the problem. And we still worked through COVID. I know the sales like might've gotten a little backed up because of different companies closing down or whatever, but um, I just, I don't believe that. Um, so what I wanna say about equity firms is that um, you can't trust them and they're liars. They'll lie straight to your face. I was at my job for 23 years and uh, I've never, the past four years, I've, I've never seen such a thing that they've done to such a good company. And um, they don't feel bad about anything that they've done. They've never apologized to us. They, they wouldn't even hardly face us as it was, but then they had security guards after they told us that we were uh, losing our jobs. They had security guards come in and walk around the building while we were working just to keep themselves safe because they thought we were gonna do something. So uh, I think it's important for people to understand uh, the importance of keeping jobs in America. And uh, these equity firms are bad for the community. And I'd also like to urge corporations that decide to sell their companies to please not sell them to equity firms. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I know how hard uh, this is for you. I can only imagine not only uh, you, but all the people in Janesville. Uh, it's brutal. And thank you for stepping up and really sharing. It's so important that this kind of news gets out. Um, let me turn next to Isabel. Isabella Burroughs, who is an associate lead at PetSmart store in Michigan. And uh, she's a member of, the, of United for Respect. Um, and this uh, BC Partners ownership has taken at least 23 billion in cash and stock dividends for PetSmart. And let me just comment as we move into uh, closing out all these stories, how, how much we see that private equity is part of everyday life. It's, it's everywhere. It's healthcare, it's retail, it's grocery stores, it's manufacturing, it's pets, 
every part of our daily life is being touched now by these investors that are just greedy to take money out of uh, Main Street companies. And this is why it's so important that the people here and others are testifying, and we will continue to do so to um, right this wrong. It's, 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 it is what is destroying America. It's not, by the way, globalization. You know, as Huffpour it lasted for 120 years and globalization has been going around for 30 years and they did not outsource or close and go to Mexico. So it is not globalization. It is financialization. It is financiers on Wall Street. And so let me turn it over now to Isabella to add on to this. Thank you. Um, my name is Isabella Burrows. I am 19 years old and I work at PetSmart in Howell, Michigan. I graduated high school this May and I live with my parents, my younger sister, and eight pets. I started working at PetSmart in late September of last year, making $10.50 an hour as a cashier. I love to paint, walk with my dogs, and cuddle with my cats. At PetSmart, I love working with animals and helping pet parents find solutions for their pets. Unfortunately, BC Partners, the private equity firm that owns PetSmart, has not shown the same concern for PetSmart employees or the animals in our care. Time and time again, they have prioritized cutting costs wherever possible and we are paying the price. When the pandemic started, BC Partners cut positions and slashed hours despite the soaring demand for pet products. As a result, short staffing is a huge source of stress at my store to this day. We are all being wrung dry. Important tasks in the pet care department just aren't getting done because there aren't enough associates. For example, reptile habitats don't get cleaned regularly and the water in our fish tanks isn't changed as often as it should be. BC Partners treats their employees as disposable and does not value our health and safety. I've seen coworkers get overheated when our AC wasn't working to the point that they had difficulty breathing with their masks on. The store shouldn't be so hot that you have to take off your mask just to feel like you can breathe. On May 22nd, Sorry. On May 22nd, my 12-year-old brother passed away unexpectedly from a health condition. My manager treated me with a complete lack of respect and empathy. She told me to get over it and that while I was at work, my feelings didn't matter. It was traumatic and I wasn't comfortable working there anymore, so I transferred to stores in mid-June. In August, I was promoted to a low-level manager position called Associate Lead with Keys, but I'm also still responsible for pet care and cashier tasks. I often feel overwhelmed and exhausted because I'm expected to work three to four jobs instead of one, as a as a manager, I'm now making $14 an hour. This is still not a move, enough to move out of my parents' house and live on my own, even though I am working full time. Throughout the pandemic, my store hasn't enforced mask mandates or social distancing. If customers ignore the social distancing stickers, there's not much we can do. And I fear that if I say something, people will become aggressive. Once a man purposely got up very close to me and coughed on me just because I was wearing a mask. BC Partners has done next to nothing to support us as frontline workers during this public health crisis. Um, being an essential worker in the time of COVID is really hard. When, I come work, when my coworkers come into work with a cough, I feel scared for my family's safety. I fear bringing COVID home to my parents, especially since my mother is high risk. I've already had one loss this year, but many times my coworkers don't feel like they have a choice because it's very difficult for part-time associates to acquire paid time off. The least BC partner could do is provide for their essential workers with sufficient paid, leave, paid sick leave during this pandemic to protect us from our, protect us, our families and our customers. My coworkers and I decided 
to take a stand and demand PC partners put pet care over profits and their, treat their associates with dignity and respect. We recently published a report highlighting how under BC Partners, ownership, incidents of pet death and neglect have skyrocketed at PetSmart. While workers continue to struggle to provide quality pet care because of understaffing, stagnant wages, lack of supplies, and broken equipment. If you are an animal lover, a PetSmart shopper, or anybody who supports essential workers in re retail, check out our new tool called the Private equity tracking system, or PETS for short, a cool app that allows you to track and document private equity abuses like the ones mentioned in our report, like understaffing and dirty stores that I also described for you today. I joined my coworkers in speaking out with United for Respect because pet smart workers like me love our jobs and want to protect ourselves, our animals, and our customers. We should be treated fairly and listened to when we have concerns. For the last year, here, BC Partners has refused to sit down with us and discuss how we can resolve these issues in our stores across the country. We are coming together to alert the public to conditions at PetSmart and urging BC Partners to do this right thing. Listen to employees and put pet care over profit. United for Respect is also part of a coalition working to pass critical legislation to encourage private equity to do right by workers, investors, and communities. Please save the date for our upcoming town hall with Senator Warren, which will focus on the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, Thursday, October 28th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. We must hold private equity firms accountable and prevent them from continuing to degenerate jobs like mine, putting essential workers at risk for the sake of profit. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you so much, Isabella, and thanks all of you for these compelling stories that across the board tell us the same thing, the absolute disregard for human life, for kindness, for generosity, for humanity. And um, we see that across the board. And now we want to turn to Jordan Nash and Chris Noble, who are from the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, so they can tell us more about what the private equity group is doing and um, give us their perspective. Uh, A uh, big thank you to everyone who has spoken so far. Um, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. My name is Jordan Ash, and I am the Labor and Jobs Director at the Private Equity Stakeholder Project. There has been a huge increase in the last few years in the number of workers employed at companies owned by private equity firms, and the largest number of these workers are concentrated in low-wage industries such as food service, retail, healthcare, and security. The largest single industry is food service, with over 1.5 million jobs. About half of those food service workers are at companies owned by Work Capital, the private equity firm that Zella Roberts and Jesse Harmon talked about. After buying Duncan Brands, Work Capital now has close to 1 million workers at its companies and franchisees. Work Capital's food service empire also includes Arby's, Jimmy John's, Hardee's, Sonic Drive-Ins, and Buffalo Wild Wings, among others. Many of the jobs at work capital owned food service companies pay an average between 10 to $12 an hour. Work has fought to keep wages low for workers. Last March, work owned Inspire Brands sent employees and franchisees a report bragging about its success in helping to kill the Federal Raise the Wage Act, which would have raised the minimum wage to $15 an hour and would have eliminated the tip credit. Work's Inspire Brands also bragged about fighting the PRO Act, which would protect workers' right to form a union. Retail is the second largest industry with over 1.1 million workers at private equity owned companies. The average pay for the most common jobs at these companies is between nine to $13 an hour. Since 2010, private equity firms and hedge funds have made substantial controlling investments in over 80 major retail companies. The largest private equity owned employers in retail are Albertson's Safeway Grocery Store, where Phil Conti works with 270,000 workers, Staples, PetSmart, where Isabella Burroughs works, and Michael's stores. 
private equity investments in the, oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, private equity firms have also been responsible for more than 600,000 job losses at retailers like Toys R Us, Sports Authority, and Art Van Furniture. Private equity investments in the healthcare industry have surged in recent years and continue to grow. And there are now over 800,000 people working in the US at private equity owned healthcare companies, such as Ed Gadomsky talked about. The Apollo Global Management Owned Hospital System, LifePoint Health, announced that it will acquire Kindred Healthcare, which will bring LifePoint's total employees to 77,000. In 2018, KKR acquired Envision, a healthcare staffing company which has 67,000 employees. KKR then bought Bright Spring Health Services, which provides home and community-based health services. This year, Pinta Capital Partners invested in Genesis Healthcare, taking the largest US nursing home operator private. Genesis operates more than 325 nursing homes and assisted living centers in 24 states. This past March, private equity firm Warburg Pincus purchased the security company G4S, which has over 533,000 employees worldwide. Warburg Pincus already owned the security firm Allied Universal, which has over 300,000 employees globally. Security officers at G4S and Allied Universal in the US are paid an average of between 12 and $14 an hour. In 2019, BC Partners acquired a majority stake in Garter World, which has 122,000 workers globally. Food service, retail, healthcare, and security are industries in which women and people of color are overrepresented and in which the majority of jobs pay less than $15 an hour. Food service occupations have the greatest concentration of workers making less than a $15 wage, more than half of the workers. Cashiers and retail salespeople are the two occupations that represent the greatest total number of workers making less than $15 per hour, about 5 million workers. Black and Latino workers make up a significant portion of the workforce in these industries. They make up almost half of fast food workers, almost one third of retail workers, half of home care workers, hospital orderlies and nursing assistants, and more than half of security officers. The private equity industry is playing an increasingly larger role in workers' lives and can't be ignored. Workers and the unions and organizations they are part of are figuring out different ways of taking on private equity. They are negotiating union contracts and overcoming aggressive anti-union campaigns to win new union elections. They are taking their message to pension funds and asking investors to support their fights. They are organizing with groups like United for Respect and Rock United. And they are coming together to call on the private equity industry to institute a set of standards. Your organization can sign on to demand that private equity firms improve conditions at the portfolio companies they own by paying a sustainable wage of at least $15 an hour, providing paid sick leave and affordable health care, committing to end occupational segregation, providing safe working conditions, paying severance during layoffs, and protecting workers' rights to organize. Unions, advocacy organizations, and community groups are also coming together to ask lawmakers at the state and federal levels to pass legislation to make private equity accountable to workers, like the federal Stop Wall Street Looting Act, which Senator Elizabeth Warren and others just reintroduced yesterday, and which my colleague Chris Noble will speak about now. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. Um, yes, as Jordan mentioned, um, Stop Wall Street um, Looting Act was uh, reintroduced by Senator Warren yesterday and the efforts at um, supporting uh, this piece of legislation have been um, uh, supported by our friends at United for Respect and Americans for uh, Financial Reform. And so just a little bit about this piece of legislation, um, you know, the main focuses on, on uh, private equity are transparency, um, preventing some of the abuses that were discussed um, so eloquently today on this call and making sure that um, private equity firms have uh, skin in the game, for lack of a better, a better term, um, you know, when it comes to their portfolio companies. So one of the first things that we'll do is create something called uh, joint and several liability so um, that pension, or sorry, private equity firms will be on the hook for um, pension-related obligations, um, debt, um, legal judgments, anything that their uh, portfolio companies might incur um, will also be applicable to the private equity firm. And that's important just so that their incentives will be al aligned. Um, when it comes to looting uh, portfolio companies, um, this, this act would, or this law would um, prohibit target firms or prohibit uh, portfolio companies from making 
distributions to private equity firms within 24 months of being required. Um, it would restrict closings and mass layoffs or outsourcing jobs within two years of being required by a private equity firm. So they can't, they wouldn't be able to simply come in there, acquire a company, strip it of its assets and leave, um, you know, workers in the lurch. And that is very important. Um, this also, uh, this, this act also prioritizes um, severance pay and other worker benefits in the event of bankruptcy. Um, you know, far too often, uh, my private equity firms are able to sort of get around that when it comes to bank bankruptcy and also pay, um, you know, bonuses and other kind of things to um, executives. In the event of bankruptcy, this, this legislation would put, put workers uh, front and center when it comes to that process. Um, lastly, I'll just, and there's, there's a lot of detail and I encourage folks to, to read um, either the summaries or, or, or the bill text. But the last point I wanna um, hammer on is um, transparency. Um, private equity is, is able to do a lot of uh, uh, things that negatively impact uh, communities, um, workers, because they, so they operate in the dark. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very opaque um, industry. And so um, what this bill would also do is require managers, private equity managers, to disclose fees, returns, and political expenditures so that investors can monitor their investments and shop around. So, um, you know, between the transparency, um, the, the, the protections for workers in bankruptcy, uh, the protections, um, you know, afforded to um, uh, portfolio companies so they don't get looted, and also uh, the joint and several liability, this is a very important piece of legislation that I encourage everybody to um, either through your union um, or, or other avenue um, lobby for so that uh, we can sort of rein in these abuses. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan and Chris. And we we do have time for questions and discussion. So I want to um, open it up. I encourage people who are listening to put your questions in the chat and we can pick up on them. And I also, while we're hearing from you, I want to throw out just a couple of questions to get uh, the panelists thinking, and uh, maybe you want to respond to some while we are uh, waiting for questions from the chat. So and the first thing I want to throw out is how, if you could talk about how difficult it has been to get your fellow workers to organize, because it, it's hard, it's challenging, uh, we know uh, people are fearful for their jobs. And we also know that this thing called private equity is so kind of amorphous that people don't even understand how they relate to their employers. So how do you approach people and what uh, do you think has worked or not worked? And any of you are, uh, I welcome you commenting on this. Who would like to jump in? Uh, hello. Um, we visited a lot of stores <clears throat> when we were going through our negotiations to get the word out. We, well, like I said, when we held those rallies, that got some people involved. And we went through the stores and we talked to quite a few of our employees to get the message across. So we got through to some, some we didn't, but some we did get through to um get involved, but that's what we did. We went around from store to store and just tried to get people, many people involved as we could. Great, other, other folks wanna jump in here. Or you might um, kind of think also about- I, I got something, I'm okay. sorry. No? Um, so when we, uh, I mean, I'd been doing a lot of rallies and different things for years, just because that's just who I am. But um, when we found out that uh, HuffCorp was closing, um, our union pulled together and um, some of our national reps come and help us get everything set up. But uh, I know that like it didn't like bring our job back, but um, what I can say is it it brought a lot more of awareness to our our community. Um, a lot of people just they don't pay attention to stuff like that, and you know, like 
people come up and say, uh, you work at HuffCore, right? And I'm like, HuffCore's gone. You know, like, where have you been? But uh, these protests and stuff, they bring awareness about these equity firms to the community as well. Um, so I think it's very important to organize and, um, and get, the, get the word out there to the people. That's great. And I, I would comment on your comment, which is that organizing it certainly goes far beyond the workplace now, right? So that organizing in the workplace, in your communities, in your neighborhoods, at your churches, um, all create a, um, a movement in which you can build on and find ways to put pressure on the private equity firm um, and also on your uh, city council or on other uh, members of the community to take action against those uh, firms themselves. Um, there's a, a question in the chat, which is, I don't know if people, I'll just take a stab at it, uh, that uh, from a university retiree who wants to know how to determine whether um, his university endowment um, is invested in private equity. And I believe uh, universities are, uh, are obligated to say where their investments are going, where the, the pension money is going or where the, the endowment money is going. So I, I believe that you could go to the university uh, trustees and get that information. It's certainly something that people have done, for example, when they're, we fought for against uh, sweatshops and we've gone to find out whether the university endowment is investing in uh, sweatshops or you know, uh, South African apartheid, you know, the companies there. So I would, I would start there as a way to find out whether your university is invested in private equity. And a lot of universities are. That's a great question. Anyone else before I, I move on? Um, what I was going to follow up with in terms of the question about organizing or getting support is you know, how you talk about getting over a fear of retaliation. So it's hard to stand up. It's so hard to put your your life, your risk, your life at risk in, in some ways, but clearly you all have done it. And so what did it take in your cases to say enough is enough? Um, if no one else is gonna go real quick. Um, for me, um, you know, I could see that there were some things that were wrong with SMART and I wanted to change, but for me, the biggest thing that got me to move to work with um, United for Respecting all that was um, my younger brother's death um, and seeing how little management cared for us. Um, I came in two days after he died to go to work to take my shift and I was pulled into the office and berated and I could see that, you know, she alienated me from my co-workers and my little brother was probably one of the sweetest souls anyone could ever know he stuck up for people and he did what was right and so because he can't do that anymore um because it's just me and my family um I decided that because he can't do it himself that um the way he can walk with me still is by doing what he would have done so I'm out here. Um, I'm out here standing up for other people that are too afraid. Um, and I was afraid to lose my job and you know get retaliation from it. But being afraid is part of what makes you stronger when it comes to these things. You have to be afraid and be willing to lose what might be the most important to get things done. And that's what this whole event has showed me. Thank you so much, Isabella. Thank you so much. Um, I thought I saw someone else. Um, Jesse, I think you were gonna jump in or? I will now. Um, you know, for me, it was just 
I was tired of uh, talking in circles. You know, I've been a, a restaurant worker before I was an organizer for about 15 years. Um, I'm originally from Atlanta where it's 213 then we have about no protection in the South. Um, and then I moved to Los Angeles and just experienced a whole different set of issues and um, you know, a whole separate set of what's happening across this country. Um, and right as I arrived, you know, I, I started to bartend in the city and realized really quickly that people were stealing um, from us and my team. Um, I've also been classified as an independent contractor many times, you know, um, and I think it just got to be in the election, I have to say, um, the 2016 election really pushed me to, we got to do something. We have to stop talking in circles. And so how can we take, um, you know, these after hour drinks, a lot of times industry workers will gather after work, you know, they organize, they talk about their issues, but what are we really doing about it? Um, and I really want to be a part of, you know, the community and people who are trying to find solutions that are better for this country and, and for the people who work so hard. Um, it's just a very moving, moving uh, movement. So that's it. Thank you. That's terrific. Does someone else want to jump in on their experience in overcoming fear? Yeah, Zella. I can remember the exact moment when I was like, I have to do something. Um, it, a customer was coughing so loud, the people in the neighboring stalls were complaining to me. Um, and when I spoke to my manager to address it, he brushed me off and said that we were in a rush. And when I walked home from work that day, I was like, this is unacceptable. I have to organize. That's fabulous. So let me, I'm going to need to end this incredible conversation um, and turn it back to Alicia. But just let me say that um, all of you are so inspiring. You give me hope. And I, I have to say that you really aren't alone. If we look at the amount of labor activism right now, the John Deere workers striking, the nurses in Worcester, Massachusetts striking for six months, the Kaiser workers threatening to strike, the Instacart workers, people all over, union organizing has never been higher. Um, it's amazing the amount of uh, frustration that is turning into positive action in this country. And so we all ought to really take inspiration from that, build the momentum to go forward. And I'm doing that with my students who are really looking for meaning and want to do something to change the world and enter social justice uh, movements. And so you all are inspiration to people like them. I'm going to be showing this webinar to my students, and I really want to thank you all for participating and for your uh, wonderful hard work. And now let me turn it back over to Alicia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Wow. We just went on a journey. We were in it together, and I am so proud of all of our participants today. Um, this is not the scripted part. This is the Alicia being emotional and being engaged in real time part. Um, but we'll go back to the script. On behalf of the Private Equity Stakeholder Project and Cornell University's ILR School, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Rosemary, for expertly moderating this conversation and providing such great insights. Um, thank you to all of our participants for being vulnerable in this space and telling your stories and being the leaders that we need right now. Thank you. Um, we know you are all very busy and we appreciate you for making space in your schedule to share your perspectives on issues of private equity labor relations that impacts us all. Uh, I wanna thank uh, Virginia and Jim for managing the various Zoom technological skills behind the scenes that people don't see, but we could not have done this without you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to all of our wonderful attendees. Thank you for participating, for asking the questions, for being engaged. And we hope that this was a valuable and informative discussion. So just before we leave, and I hope you all can stay just a couple of minutes more, I wanted to give just a last shout out to a couple campaigns we'd love for you to participate in. So please consider supporting Zella's efforts by signing on to their Sonic petition, asking the company to give customers the option to tip tipped workers, 
Okay, I'm gonna say that again, tip, tipped workers via credit cards in the car hop stalls and require that customers wear masks in those car hop stalls to protect employees. I want you to stand in solid, if you want, please stand in solidarity with PetSmart workers uh, by signing on to their petition. Workers are calling on the owner of PetSmart uh, private equity firm BC Partners to meet with a committee of frontline workers to discuss and resolve worker concerns. Um, and to support Refresco workers, please check out their Twitter campaign asking owner PAI partner uh, to recognize their employees union. Uh, links will be in the chat and we will also send out um, a, uh, an email after this with all of the pertinent links. Um, we will also be sending out a short feedback survey to each of you and would appreciate any reflections that you can provide on this forum. Your feedback will help us improve how we approach forums and webinars going forward. Um, and we'll put a link in the, in the chat, but if that doesn't work, don't worry, we're gonna send you uh, an, an email. And for more information on private equity employers, how you can get engaged, how you can get involved, how you can connect with a private equity stakeholder project, please visit our website at pestakeholder.org. Again, that's pestakeholder.org. And thank you.